welcome to the NBS Reviews and Discussions Podcast. I am your host, Norman Sanzu. Joining me today is Silver Quill. Hello, assemble! Yay! I'm waiting very much for Avengers Endgame. I can't wait. That trailer came out really awesome. I'm not going to be able to talk like this for the entire review. Yay! <laughs> but yes... In today's episode, we are going to wrap up the Legends of Magic, quote unquote wrap up, um, series by reviewing issue 7 to 12 in one shot because, well, it's kind of an overarching story and it will be kind of silly for us to spoil the story by not telling you how it ends. So, in, okay, um, for me to say in this issue, because there's going to be Seven issue. So I'm just going to summarize it. It's the Avengers. They're assembling a team to deal with the bad guys. So yay. Succinctly put. Yes. So I think first impressions are in order. Yeah, overall impressions perhaps. Yeah. So what do you think, Silva? Well, I really love this series. This is one of my favorite IDW uh, creations. It's fun to see these characters come together, play off one another. It is notable how different they are than they would appear in um, Shadow Play, especially Somnambula. We'll get into that later. But you can mark that there's an IDW personality and a show personality. And nine times out of ten, which is pretty impressive considering there's only six pillars, I gravitate more towards the IDW personalities. Okay, here's the thing. Didn't we agree or didn't we have this mindset where we enjoy the IDW version of the ponies even better than the show ponies, especially Luna? Well, I enjoy Luna, period. Luna, Luna, Luna! Yeah, I mean, um, what drove me to love Luna was the IDW comic of... What was it again? Micro, was it? I forgot. Yes. What was the issue with her trying to take over Celestia's day job for a bit? I forgot. Micro, was it? Yeah, that was the Lunar Micro, and it's a sentiment that does come up again and again. It just applies here to the pillars as well. True that. And the characteristic that the comic writers have is, I think they're a bit loose, looser than what we get in the show, because um, the show has a really constrained time of how they want to present the characters. Uh, I think once we delve into the series where Rock Hoof has his own episode, we get more out of it, and also Star Swirl. So, yeah, th that's going to be a lot of conversation there, but that's besides the point. But you were saying, Silva? Some of the conflicts I enjoyed more than others, usually those that really showed them working together to solve a problem, whereas others, it seemed like one or two solved it, or, even more bizarre, it was sort of a non-event. But that's the whole point of a team-up story, where there's an overarching character arc where we get to meet each other, we get to be friends with one another, and in the end, we fight the villain and whatnot. So, to me, this is kind of a team group-up story where we get to see the pillars join up to defeat the bad guys. So, this is a really awesome story here. I mean, I really, really like it. And then the ominous ending as you realize that from one triumph comes a greater tragedy. Yeah, I mean, like what, uh, in Dark Knight, uh, Batman, Dark Knight, or whatever that series was called, um, you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself turn into a villain? Yep, pretty much. Although then apparently you go on to star in a lackluster finale that everyone treats you as the second coming. <laughs> yeah, but uh, how do I put this? For this, I think we shared our opinion and we like it a lot. So let's get right on to it or into it. If you guys have not read this comic yet, stop here and go read it. Welcome back. I hope you really enjoyed the story because we did. So we start off the adventure with... Oh sorry, before we continue on, how do we want to do this? Scene by scene or themes? Because I feel like scene by scene will go faster. Scene by scene will go faster. Uh... I don't think we need to go over every scene in detail because sometimes it's very straightforward. Yep, I think this goes back to the previous issue with uh, Miss Main. No, not Miss Main. Uh, Mitch Meadowbrooks with how there's a lot of action and we can, well, kind of summarize things going on. So yeah, we're going to go for that logic. So scene by scene then. So we start off the comic with Sunburst. 
getting excited to read a book and it's Star Swirl's diary and whatnot. Though you can tell Sunburst is a true passion because he's excited that all his notes are wrong. <laughs> Only someone with true passion would be that happy. Yep, and <laughs> his notes are wrong. Like, okay, okay, buddy boy, you're the first person I know that is happy to say all of their notes. All of their notes are wrong. So that means those years of research that you did meant nothing. Great. So, yeah, um, I was saying um, there's a knock at the door. And it seems there's another book for... Sunburst to read, and said book comes from a secret admirer with a note in, and it says, it's time that both sides of the story were told. I hope this aids in your study. So, like any child with a new toy, old toys dumped to a side, and new book is being read. And the new book is, well, spoilers, is written by Stygian, the previous villain for the comics. Or this series. You know, the shadow guy person thingy? Yes, it's his book and his time. And it's from his point of view. Although what's funny is that he doesn't even get his name mentioned until I think three or four issues in. Really? Yeah. He is not named at any time in the first several issues. I think they have. You know what? I'm looking through the comics. So if I notice something, I'll let you know. If not, then it's true. So anywho... Stygian here is a scholar. He likes collecting seashells and doing research on seashells. So he started off his day by going to the beach and gathering seashells because he likes seashells. Suddenly, there is a call. You might say a siren's call. And boom, you got the dazzling. Yo. He's like, sup? Yep. We just came from a lackluster Fiendship is Magic issue and we're looking for a reboot. Can you help us? Yep, yep. <laughs> Uh, that reminds me of that Hulk movie by John Woo. <laughs> uh, boys. Woo. So anyway, the sirens come. The dazzling, if you say. And uh, Sonata looks badass because she's posing in cross arm, like not giving a dang. And like she's like, say, yep, I'm, I'm, I'm the tough one. Yep. <laughs> tacos? I don't even like tacos. <laughs> yep. So, long story short, Dazzling here tries to recruit Stygian to, well, uh, surf under her hoof and give her big powers. But Stygian says, nah man, you want an agent? Go look for yourself, yo, because I got no idea how to be an agent. Upon hearing this, he goes to the library to do some research and he finds a book by Starfall the Bearded, a guide to magical and legendary creatures. And he starts reading about it until a pony calls him to help a old grandma with chores. This takes him a lot of time because back then they didn't have any machinery to do the work. So, yay. Or Big Macintosh. They didn't have a Big Macintosh to get things done with super efficiency. That True. pony does make me wonder if uh, it might be a distant relative of the apples. Yeah, I didn't notice that. She has an apple cutie mark. Apples. <laughs> with a worm going through it. So, oh. Rotten Apple. But didn't they say the name? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Moss. Yeah, say, yeah. Malice. Yeah, that's, that's so, her name, I think. Yep, well, that could, the cutie mark might explain the attitude. Yep, yep. A lot of sass. So, anywho, uh, upon finishing the job, Stygian goes back to town and notice that, hey, um, why does this seem so creepy? And, oh no, the sirens are sucking all the magic from the ponies and yeah that's not good that that's terrible and decides to head away from the site and kind of tries to find heroes that will help him pause why does this or this situation here is a bit silly because when you look at the scenario that's going on there's trouble Stygian tries to find the answer for the problem and sees a book and said book was not even real they're myth and legends so if there were no pillars Stygian would have been just walking around looking for things that don't exist technically that's a dumb plan 
Oh, but maybe it's the only plan. I mean, you've been confronted by something that you thought was fantastic or mythical. So basically, if you have to accept that this was not just myth, can you really dismiss others so easily? It is always kind of funny when My Little Pony dismisses something as a legend or fairy tale when they have hydras and manticores and chimeras. To them, these are everyday creatures, or at least proof of existence, whereas they're still fantastical ideas. And so it's a, it is readjusting your perspective on the world. But it's also, well, a desperate gambit because he's got nothing else that can help. Celestia and Luna aren't even, uh, they aren't even household names yet, I think. Yeah, true that. Because I think this was before the heartwarming thing, the United Pony thingy. I think that was before that. Who knows? I don't remember. Really? That, that far ahead? Hmm. Although Stygian opens this tale by insisting, I am no hero. And yet he goes on this, this long quest to find an answer, taking on challenges that other people would deem impossible, or, as you point out, nonsensical. And so it, very much that is the criteria of a hero, to test yourself, uh, to take on the test that others are not willing to, and to try and fail is also part of being a hero. True that, true that. I forgot to mention the beginning where Stygian starts off the story be saying that I am no hero. But yeah, anyway... Um, yes, complaints aside, we see that Stygian is going on this suicide mission and packing his things, especially seashells, because he gets boring, so seashells. He walks past the town and sees that the town is in shambles because the sirens are sucking up their magic and and if you remember how the sirens work, they thrive on chaos and conflict. So yes, that's going on. So we see our pal Stygian crossing across the sea, land, and fighting giant crabs. Well, there's a cream for that. <laughs> Not that kind of crab. Aye, aye, aye. So, anywho, upon crossing the ocean and whatnot, he reached upon a town, a peaceful town, but a bit psychotic because they like to live near an active volcano. You idiots. That's dangerous. So, he walks through town asking ponies if he can help him find a person. And he fell into a ditch. And, well, said person says, Yo, I think you're having problems. Let me help you. And said person is Rockhoof. One odd thing about Rockhoof's town in this issue, everyone's walking around like they're in shell shock. I don't know if they're worried because of the current crisis, but uh, they're just not even seeing Stygian. So when he falls down, it's like, Hey, there's a guy in a pit. Anyone want to chime in here? Also, if you look at the layout of the last issue of the last page of this issue, uh, the placement of Rockhoof standing over Stygian as a he's shadowy, but he's also a figure of hope. It actually reminds me of a scene from Spider-Man Maximum Carnage, Ooh. in which Captain America appears to lend a hand to a pretty much beaten Spider-Man. And so I, I don't know if it's intentionally an homage or if it's just the layout is complimentary, but I enjoyed seeing the comparison. It could be an homage because it is really it is a really cool scene. And the ponies for Rockhoof's town, I think they're more concerned about the volcano being active and stuff. So um, not really paying attention to Stygian is kind of forgivable. I don't know. When a guy's coming up to you, excuse me, hey, hey, can you help me? Hey. If you don't speak the language, I think you can just be, you can at least offer some form of uh, acknowledgement that you heard them. And plus the artwork doesn't help. It looks like a lot of people, a lot of ponies are staring wide-eyed and looking very concerned. Yeah, like I mentioned before, active volcano going through, but still, um, <coughs> complaints aside. Hot stuff coming through. <laughs> yep, yep. So, complaints aside, we move on to book number eight. And book number eight is the recruitment of Rockhoof. So, um, there's a short summary of Rockhoof's adventure from the TV show in this one. So, that's awesome. But I'm going to skip it because it's just a one-page thing. So, Rockhoof helps Stygian out of the ditch. And Stygian just asks, like, uh, thanks, man. Like, I'm looking for a legendary hero named Rockhoof. And Rockhoof just says, what, me, legendary hero? Come on, I'm not that awesome, but I am a hero. And 
upon hearing this, Tijin says, oh cool, you're Rockhoof. Dude, I need you on a mission to help me because my town is is in trouble by, what you call this, sirens. So please help me. And Rockhoof just says, I love to, but I have my own problems right now. Uh, how about later and see how that works? Because stuff. And with that, Commander Captain, what's her name again? Oh, uh, Com- Commander Stella. Yeah, Commander Stella comes in, um, berating Rockhoof because, what are you doing? We have problems to solve and we need to deal with the fishes because of the bear thingies. So we need to kind of solve that right now. And Stygian just interjects and saying, uh, I think I have an idea how to save the fish. May I see a map, please? And he looks at the map and sees, oh, this would be a good solution. And Captain Stelas just asks, kid, what's going on? You're not telling us what you're thinking. And Stygian just says, oh, uh, if you reroute the lake here, you could save the fish. Uh, so the bears won't hunt them and stuff. So yay, much awesomeness. I also enjoy the enemies, the lumber, the lumber bears. Lumber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my back hurts. I think I may need lumber support. <laughs> Just don't get a lumber hug. <laughs> uh, Tim Burr, wolf. <laughs> oh, boys. But anywho, uh, with the, with Sijin explaining the plan, uh, Rockhoof kind of digs a moat. This, would you call this a moat? I'd call it more of a channel. Ah, channel. All right, then. So, with that, Rockhoof digs a channel to kind of reroute the lake stream so that the fishes won't be eaten by the lumber. And yeah, things are going well. And uh, Captain Stella says, uh, double time it because it looks like the volcano is about to erupt. And with that, Rockhoof doubles times it. And yay, the fishes are going in. And oh no, the water that Stygian is holding back kind of goes through. With that, Stygian says, oh no, this is bad and Rockhoof may need help. I'm going to help him. And Captain Stella says, I need you here. Oh gosh, now I need to deal with the lumber myself. Oh gosh. And she's just so no nonsense about this. Uh, well, the rest of the mighty helm was less than, well, mighty. I I really love Captain Stella. I'm sad that she's stuck in Equestria's past. She'd be a great character to see again. Yeah, she is awesome. Like she has an already she has a really awesome character design. She's just fun and whatnot and well, she she's just awesome. So, with this going on, there's this three uh, nine panel thing. If you were to read it from left to right, it's kind of cool, but if you read it from top to bottom, it is much awesomeness. So the scenario here is Captain Stella has to fight the Lumber on her own. Ro- Stygian is chasing down Rockhoof so he doesn't drown. Rockhoof here is trying to dig a moat and, well, not drown in the chaos. And it seems at the last minute, Stygian managed to carry him up via his shovel and, well, save him. Much awesomeness. Well, I love that Rockhoof admits, uh, I didn't really plan an exit strategy. <laughs> and, you know, here's the American government. So, like, we feel your pain, Rockhoof. Oh, my goodness. And with... It's sad because it's oh, true. God. And with that, Captain Stella says, Rockhoof, pack up your things because you're going to help this little buddy of mine. And with that, Rockhoof says, all right, where is your town? Let's go. And Stygian says, no, not yet, because we need to assemble a team and hark an adventure. Yay! Shall I roll my d20 to see where we go? Well, we got to get the party together and don't split them up. Never split the party. No, that's the most important part. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Foresight. Although, uh, I also just, I think uh, Stygian really lucked out with having Rockhoof as the first pillar he encountered. Rockhoof is this big brother in a good way. Uh, just sort of watching over you, giving you support, or just uh, paying heed when everyone else is trying to dismiss Stygian. Yeah, and Rockhoof here, Rockhoof and Stygian has this really awesome dynamic where 
like you mentioned, he is the big brother to Stygian. And those two are awesome together because even though Rockhoff doesn't understand all the mambo Jambo science that Stygian is talking about, he listens. And that that there t- tells how caring Rockhoff is. So, yeah, Rockhoff is awesome. And, uh, and just re- it will make sense, especially as we get into this later, uh, with the annual, Rockhoof is going to be the one who interacts with Stygian the most. True that, true that. But anyway, uh, we carry on the story with uh, montage, yay, camping montage and stuff. So, yay. So, they head to a swamp and Stygian's kind of scared of the place because it looks creepy and whatnot. Mind you, this is before the Pegasi control the weather and the stuff. So, this is strange. And Rockhoof just says, oh, don't be silly, little one. I am here to protect you. There's no scary thing and about, so I will protect you. Oh, look, a cute little bunny. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, we see... This, that rabbit's a killer. We see the spawn of evil. It's Angel Bunny's predecessor. Yes, indeed. So Rockhoof here just says, oh, what a cute little bunny. Ah, oh, my nose, he's got my nose. Ah! I warned you, that rabbit's got a vicious streak a mile wide. Yep, and the the bunny is evil. The bunny is pure evil. And you know what's more pure evil? It's calling its friends. The deers, the birds. I have questions about the deer, but I'll hold it because... Uh, let's move on. <laughs> so, anywho, as they run for their lives from the herbivore... They say, what could we do? Oh, look, there's a pile of leaves. Let's hide in that pile. Maybe it's safe. So before they even head to the pile, they get tackled by a masked villain. Oh, no, it's a hippogriff that's trying to eat them. Ooh. At least they believe in hippogriffs, kind of. Yep. Honestly, Stygian, Stygian's worldview is being challenged on so many levels all the time. So true. Like, it's a hippogriff. And t- it's telling by how Rockhoof says or what. Because uh, I guess hippogriffs are rare Pokemons and that they don't appear a lot. And if they do, do you throw a Master Ball at them? Nah, you throw an Ultra Ball because Master Balls are only for the highest of rarities. A Magic Carp. <laughs> carp, Carp, Carp. <laughs> oh, yes. Quick shout out to uh, Sapphire Heart Song who is, has the title of a Magic Carp Master Pokemon what? Trainer. Really? Yep. Check her Twitter. Oh, my goodness. It, it made a real splat. <laughs> uh, it's super effective. <laughs> so, anywho, um, as they kind of wonder what the quote unquote hippogriff is trying to do, they see that, yay, the herbivores was caught in a net that the hippogriff set up from the big pile of leaves. So, the hippogriff kind of tries to talk to Stygian and the crew and they couldn't understand because they couldn't understand Equestrian or something like that. Maybe he's talking Nipponese. Who knows? And the Hippogriff takes off his head. Oh no. Decapitation! <laughs> yes, and no, it's a mask, silly. And it's Miss Main. Yay, don't tell Miss Main. Uh, it's, and it's uh, Mitch Meadowbrook. Yay! And Rockhoof is instantly smitten. He was just, wow, she's really something. I know. And before you say this, Sil- sorry, and before you say this, Silver, I ship this. As do I. Yeah, they, they make a cute couple. So anyway, as Miss Main travels, or as Miss Main walks with the crew, uh, Sijin is... You, you, keep, you keep saying Miss Main, it's Mace Brother, bro. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I don't know why. Uh, it's rare that I see Mace. Anyway. Uh, as Mitch Meadowbrooks walks with the crew, she, uh, Stygian just uh, tries to recruit her to the team. But Mage here says, I can't. I ne- you see those creatures, right? I-, I need to help them first because if not, things will be in chaos. Somehow, Stygian says, um, I can understand because uh, just imagine what an aggressive alligator would look like. And with that, Mage Meadowbrook gets the idea and visits an alligator, a talking alligator. Wow, that's something. So, yeah, she can talk to an 
There's just a little bit of Fluttershy in this one. Uh, not really, because this is the only alligator that can speak, because the alligator picked up from Mage, because Mage was talking to her, and somehow... It, it, it's basically a meow. <laughs> Spends all point on trying to talk human, but can't do anything, like Payday. <laughs> I gotta say, Norman, I'm a little concerned about this Pokemon craze of yours. Let's... All of a sudden, all things are Pokemon. <laughs> it's five degrees of Pokemon. Let's go, Eevee, and let's go, Pikachu just came out, man. <laughs> oh, boys. Let's all go with the Eevee. Let's all go with the Eevee. Uh, but anywho, I, I think that will pass soon enough. But anyway, uh, the Gator says, the po- uh, I'm not going to be friends with you because my mom told me that uh, you ever bore suck because you bit my little brother's nose or a squirrel bit my little brother's nose and stuff. So we be friends. And with that, a mage here goes to every creature. The tree bears, the owls, the snake, the barracudas. And it seems that all of the... What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, animal that eat meat. Uh, carnivores? Yes, thank you. Uh, carnivores here are really scared of the herbivores. Like, something's amiss. And it seems that the herbivores, the plant-eating creatures, are quote-unquote poisoned by the plants they're eating. And it seems that the plant that they're eating is making them very aggressive. And if you really think about it, that is a really good defense mechanism. It's an interesting defense mechanism, but uh, it also organizes them to have torches. And in one deer's case, candles on its antlers. I am impressed that they're innovation. You know what? There's no pitchfork. I'm disappointed. Minus 10 out of 10. <laughs> well, now, why would an herbivore have a pitchfork? They don't need to... They just eat the stuff. They don't really, you know, make it, get ready for harvesting. Uh, true, but I'm just saying. But yeah, um, our little herbivores here are kind of aggro. Like, they, they do not mess around like they, they want to kill you yeah so we move on to book number what was this again nine and like like before we have rock hoof there's a short story about mage and just go watch the tv series and you got it there so anyway the herbivores here are on a rally to burn down the ponies oh my goodness <laughs> talk about angel bunny's predecessor these animals are mad well, it looks like some of them even dropped their torches and they're now on fire. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, In my goodness. Their rage. The, the only thing worse than an, than an angry army of herbivores is an angry army of herbivores on fire. Yeah. And still coming after you. Yeah. So, oh. so anywho, um, Meech sure devises a plan. She concocts a potion to cure the animals. Uh, Rock hoof. Stands by the door and Stygian throws potion in the room, in the potion room to the animals below. And Major just says, okay, um, I don't need to say this, but don't throw any acid or fire at them, please. So yeah, we're all good, right? Okay, yeah. So. By the by, mm-hmm. I believe that th- this page uh, of this issue is the first time Stygian is named in the comics. Really now? Where is it? Where it's where Mage Meadowbrook says, "Stygian, follow me up top. I got some ideas." I believe that's the first time anyone's referred to him by name. I'm trying to see. Okay, Stygian. Oh yeah. Hmm. You know what? I have to agree. I don't remember. Upon trying to reread this, I don't remember Stygian's name being said once until this point. And you know what? Yeah. Okay, that's kind of cool. And I think there's a reason for this. Oh, what is that reason, man? If you rule out the early airings, which threw everything into chaos, as mm-hmm. they keep doing more and more each season, uh, this issue was meant to come out just after Shadow Play. Until then, no one really knew Stygian. He hadn't been named or hinted or anything. So they didn't. Wa- I don't think they wanted to give his name away. But now the episode's aired. The secret's out. Let's have at it. Ah, you know what? That's, that makes a good point. Yeah, but it kind of messes up with the whole flow of the comic slash series because when uh, Sunburst got the book, I 
it's assumed that the chaos ended. The chaos? What chaos? Uh, which we call this uh, season seven, where the pillars fought. Like it's assumed that uh, Sunburst finished the adventure. Well, I mean, uh, well, he got the book after they after Shadow Play. That's basically this is my side of the story after I Stygian had been uh, restored. So yeah. So yeah, but that adventure is done. But it does make sense by Sunburst getting the book because it signs with an S instead of a Stygian. So the mystery's still there. You know what? We're kind of dragging this along. Let's move on. Yes, moving forward. Yes. But it is funny that, that we're three issues in and only now Stygian has been named. True that. So anywho, I like this line by <laughs> Rockhoof. And Ferris is in here. Rockhoof just asked... Mage, why don't you have a lock on the door? I mean, no bolts, no nothing. Isn't that that's dangerous? And Mage's answer to Rockhoof is simple. I live in the middle of the swamp. Who's going to break in? 10 out of 10. Restore fate. I also love that when she talks about uh, head-butting bunnies, Rockhoof actually wants to open the door. <laughs> like he wants, to, he wants to test his noggin against the, an angry bunny. <laughs> I love Rockhoof. Rockhoof is just super fun. Like we mentioned before, he's that big brother that you always wanted. <laughs> and then he gets the headbutt William Wallace pony. It's like, <laughs> and he wins. All hail Rockhoof, the bunny headbutter. <laughs> Yay. So anywho, um, a lot of action going on. Um, I recommend you go reading the book for this scene. But Rockhoof, oh, uh, William Wallace bunny, Kicks down the door, tries to attack Rockhoof. Rockhoof hits buzz it, yay. And Stygian up there throws stuff. And somehow a tree grew because he threw stuff. And he just throws a lot of stuff. Upon throwing another potion, um, said potion is the Brava Bull. And all of the creatures somehow got buff. Well, he, thro- he throws a tree growing potion first. Oh, true that. And that, true that. And that, and that gives the bunnies uh, a branch to spring at him, but then they get hit with a dizzy spell. But then, yeah, then then it's the buff. He th- <laughs> he's like a blizzard with its characters. He keeps buffing and nerfing them with no <laughs> rhyme or reason. Yeah, but oi, oi, oi. The, the, <laughs> if you want to have nightmares, go look at this page because it's a busy bunny head having. Overload muscular bodies. Rob Liefeld would be proud of this page. Well, Rob Liefeld did that for every character. Here, it's at least with intent. The smaller you make the head, the more massive the body appears. It's a it's a common trait in Japanese anime with giant robots. Uh, they got the tiny heads so that they their big barrel chests are just massive, massive things. <laughs> oh my goodness! But anywho. Um, Stygian comes down warning Rockhoof about buff bunnies and they discover that Mage is nowhere to be found and Silver you want to go for the line that you always say nowhere to be found surprise continuity no it doesn't fit here no ninja ninja healer well it's Dr. McNinja that's my pony <laughs> or how about ninja ninja rap go ninja go ninja go <laughs> Yeah, but anywho, Ninja Healer comes along and cures the wild herbivores. And yay! Now they have time to relax and Stygian pleads his plea to Mage. And Mage says, you know what? Let's go. I'm I'm in. And your town is in danger and I think you really need my help. So I'm in. Let's go. And oh my goodness. Mage here just tells her story about Zombie ponies. Continuity! Yeah, there you go. See, now it's the time for my lines. Go you ahead, gotta pick man. Your meme. You gotta pick your memes. Continuity! Yay! Now comes the shipping. Oh, yes. The shipping. So before they head out, uh, Misha decides to have a little feast, like cook for everyone. And Rokufia says, oh, thanks for the hospitality. I'm sure you're not used to cooking so much. A little man, like, he, before he finished the sentence, <laughs> Miss Main's dish is as much as 
rock hooves here. And oh my goodness, Sid Pony can eat. Like, Miss Main, <laughs> she eats like a pig. <laughs> and yet she's a perfect match for rock hoof. And he he falls in love. It is true, the way to rock hoof's heart is his stomach. And true. apparently her stomach as well. True that. And oh my goodness, this is a fun ship. I, I approve of this ship. I really want them to hook up. Like, this is fun. And Rocco says, I think we're in love. Yay! Much awesomeness. Well, e- even even comic author Jeremy Wheatley said, yeah, I kind of envision these two as a couple. He likes the idea of the healer and the warrior. Yeah, much fun. All together. So, anywho, we continue on our adventure with a montage! A traveling montage! You need a montage. You need a montage. Montage. So anyway, they end up at the which we call this um, Royal Pegasus uh, Pegasi Royal Legion camp, and yay, they're here, and they notice that the well, uh, Pegasus Royal Legion camp thingy is above clouds, and that's going to be tough to get up because they don't have wings to fly up there. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh. And in comes Grimhoof for an example of military socialization. Yep. It's an insight thing. We we peasants won't know. And yes. But no, there's a ma- there's uh there's logic to the madness here because if you notice right, Silver, the way that they're talking is like uh I'm just gonna paraphrase here because he says, uh, who are you? I am this person, and who are you? I am this person. Uh and Name and rank, because uh, the banter that they're having is screen match kind of deal. But at the same time, they're conversing their rank and reasons to be there. And in the end, Mage here just says, "Maybe you should step in before we end up in jail." And Sijin says, "I think you're right, gentlemen. There's no need for there's no need to fight." And Rockhoof here just says, "Fight." Oh no, we're not fighting. We're just interacting, and we're buddies now. And funny thing is, I've I've hung around with enough military bronies at conventions to know that is actually how they do it. It is a competition to see who had it worse, <laughs> who who had the the least hospitable living uh, conditions, who had the worst equipment, who had the meanest officers. You win by suffering. <laughs> okay, makes sense. But if you ever if you ever want to break a marine, tell them that uh, air force air force officers and uh, basically personnel get hazard pay for living in marine barracks. <laughs> oh god, there's hazard pays. Whew, that's bad because they're so inhospitable. Oh my goodness. But so that's a good time. Good time. But this little interaction here is just awesome. But silver. I have to pull back a bit. What do you think of the writing for that scene there? Well, I've never served in the military, so I I imagine that there's a great deal more cursing and maybe not as much uh, overtly camaraderie afterwards. From the outside looking in, it would just look like a fight, but it means something to the guys who actually serve. Mm -hmm. So I I like the writing because it, it speaks to something in the real world, and it just makes the two characters look funny. It's kind of like what we talked about when we were going over the heartswarming club, betraying expectations. You think they're about to start a fight when really this is their version of hello. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That is very true. And you know what? I love this scene alone. Like this here is just awesomeness. So yeah, let's carry on. Let's carry on. So anyway, um, Rocco here says, okay, we're looking for a Pegasi named Flash Magnus. Could you help us with this? And... What was his name again? I, I kind of forgot. Sorry, my bad. Well, well, this is this is Grimhoof. Although I love that Rockhoof uh, mentions he's looking for Hey Garrick, Mary Allen, Winnie West, <laughs> all <laughs> variants on the Flash. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness, I didn't notice that. <laughs> Flash. Ah! Oh, sorry, wrong Flash. Oh my goodness, I didn't notice that. Oh my goodness. Savior of Equestria. Oh my You'll goodness. steal all your waifus. Oop, wrong flash again. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Okay, um, for all those at home who got no idea, hey, Garrick, I mean, uh, I forgot the real name, but 
Barry Allen, uh, Wally West are Flash, uh, DC's speedster, Flash. Uh, Garrick is Jay Garrick. Jay Garrick, all right. It's like, oh my goodness, I did not notice that. Oh my goodness. E. Did, did you notice that on the first read or did someone point it out to you? Uh, it had to be pointed out to me. I was so taken in by expanding the pillars, the joke went right over my head. Oh my goodness, that is awesome writing. This is just top notch. I like it. So yeah, oh, let's get back on track. Let's get back on track. Bucket hit here just says like you can't because Flasher is at the front lines trying to fight off some creatures. And Rockhoof just says, creatures, I can lend a hand because I am the mighty Rockhoof, the Shovel Knight. And upon seeing the creatures that Flash are going to fight, they're dragons. Yes, and Rockhoof says, uh, maybe I should step out of this one. Step down, yeah. Hmm. I, I, I don't want to be toasted. Maybe I shouldn't speak in the third person. <laughs> maybe he's taking le- No, no, he's not even born yet. I was about to say maybe he's taking lessons from Iron Will, but no, no, no. He's not even born yet. <laughs> Or the great and powerful Trixie. Not even born yet. So, anywho, let's move on to the next issue, and that's issue 10. So, this is something interesting. There's no backstory to this one, like in the previous books. So, we just get right into the story because it's really awesome. We get to see Flash Magnus trying to do battle with the dragons. And before they could even start... Stygian is calling to talk to them and the two just stop fighting for a bit because they're just puzzled by why is this creature here hailing us down? Are you mad? There's going to be a war zone here. You should kind of run and hide. Plus, Stygian's got some lungs on him. Yeah. You know, he could be using the uh, magnifying megaphone spell to make his voice louder. Probably, I don't know. So anyway, uh, long story short, uh, Rockhoof here kind of heals Flash down and I just love the banter between the dragon and Flash here because uh, like you mentioned before subvert expectations yeah <laughs> well I mean Rockhoof despite his earlier hesitation he's now calling a dragon an overgrown iguana <laughs> uh, yeah and I just love the banter between Flash and my, uh, the dragon here like you want me to toast him or something like that? Like, oh my goodness. And just wishing him good luck. Like, oh my goodness, that is just so much fun. And the fact that uh, Rocco is basically shouting down a war. <laughs> yeah. So, anywho, um, Rocco gets Flash's attention, and now it's Tijian's turn to talk to Flash, or as they say, do the sales pitch. So, with that, Stygian pleads his problem to Flash. And putting that aside, um, Rockhoof here talks to Mage because Mage has been looking at the dragons for a bit and is smitten by those dragons. And Mage here notice there's something wrong with the dragons, like something's not right. And Rockhoof here says, well, why don't you go talk to them? Maybe you can help. And with that, this gives mage the confidence to go up to a dragon and talk to it. While this is happening, Stygian just pleads his case because, you know what, I'm just gonna say he's trying to recruit ponies to save his town. There, uh, this will kind of streamline things. And upon that, Flash just says, i really love to help you there, but I have a war to deal with because if not, Equestria is going to get burned. So, yeah, I have to do this. Turns around, sees dragon flies away. What? (laughs) This is kind of weird. This is the first crisis where the new introduction doesn't help at all. You mean Flasher? Yeah, he doesn't, he isn't part of the solution. It's true, but the situation here right now is that he is preventing a war, which might happen soon enough, or might happen if he doesn't try to stop it. But as they always say, a different point of view, a different way to look at a problem. And luckily enough, Mature is that different point of view because she, like before, sorry, she, like I mentioned before, went up to a dragon and asked what's wrong. And here, Mitch knows the problem or discovers the problem and gave a solution to the problem. 
and said problem is the dragons have what they call wing break, where the sickness makes a dragon lose their wings. But Mage has seen this problem before, and uh, she calls it uh, scale rot, and she gave a medicine and teach the dragons how to make it. And with that, the dragon leave. So, problem solved! Yay! Now Flash has to join the team! Woo! But, but here's the thing, Norman. Every adventure we've seen thus far has featured new perspective brought in by Stygian and his crew into the situation. It, But the pony they're helping would still have a role in affecting, in executing that solution. Flash Magnus got really shortchanged here. True. <laughs> True that. And you know what? I, I got no excuse. I got no answer for this because the Mitch Meadowbrook solving the problem story was just awesome to overlook it. And you know, when you really look at it, Mitch here asked Rockhoof, um, did you really knew I could do it? And Rockhoof just bluntly says, I'm not really sure, but I know that you could do it because you're a good pony and the way that the animals in the swamp treated you, they respected you and he says the line, I learned a long time ago, sometimes taking time to find out what your enemies want proves they were never an enemy to begin with. Silver, say it! Say it, Silver! Ninja... What? Ninja medic? No, continuity! Well, I'm sorry, but I don't, I don't know if I've seen that message before. No. Never had... Remember the one in the book where he... Where, where, Legends of Magic where he was um, going up the hill with the crap thingy? Ah, yes. The, ah, yes. Man, I can't even... I know the Brazilian monster, but I can't remember its name. Yeah, see? It is continuity. <laughs> There's a lot of it. Oh, boys. But with that, <laughs> uh, Mitchell just says... Thanks, Rockhoof, you're a good friend. And, well, they move on to the next town. And, oh my goodness, talk about zombies. No! And I love that Mage Meadowbrook is like, I didn't spill a potion, right? You're all seeing this. <laughs> yep. Uh, so, they go to the Middle East. Wow, okay. Well, they go to what will be Somnambula, but it's, I guess, Southern Equestria? Yep, looks like it. And there's mummies. There's a lot of mummies that want to eat their brains. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm having flashbacks. But, uh, well, hey, if you want real continuity, we could always talk about uh, the kissing zombies of Miraculous. Kiss her, kiss her. God, no. Ah! But, the satanic powers of kissing. <laughs> Quick, someone get Sapphire back on the phone. We got to get her in on this. Oh, gosh. Oh, oh gosh. But anywho, uh, let's carry on because this reminds me of, well, her adventure with zombie ponies. Yes, continuity. Yeah. So um, as they try to find a way to solve a problem here, I think what? Sijin here says, um, they're, they're, what do you mean? Uh, they're not zombies. They're mummies. Uh, legendary creatures in Southern Equestria. And with that, it gives uh, Flash and Rockhoof here the green light to go really aggro. And they do! Yeah, see, now Flash Magnus gets to contribute by beating the stuffing out of mummies. Yes, and beating up the dude. Real good. And Stygian says to Mage, Okay, uh, I think we should just... Stand back and let those two do the job while we try to find a solution. <laughs> and make sure, speak for yourself. I've been spoiling for a fight. <laughs> oh my goodness, the white mage is a ninja. Ninja medic, Dr. McNinja is, is indeed going, that's my pony. <laughs> that's the ninja theme song. Yeah. So anywho. Uh, the pony or the zombie ponies or the mummies try to go after Stygian too. And let's just say that our heroes are not looking well. Like they are in a pickle, as they say. And somehow, suddenly, there is a Kamehameha blast. And 
Said blast comes from Sonambula. Oh, goodness me. Who just blows everything up, including our heroes. Oh, story over. Oh, my little pony. Nah, um, it seems that uh, the Glopes have magical powers. Yay? Yes, indeed. Apparently, it can cause explosions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now it's a, now it's a blow pass. <laughs> uh, please. But anywho, uh, Sonembla says, "Oh right, all oh, right, you guys are here," uh, and explains the situation where, okay, um, there's this gem, is has a curse on it, and it puts my it puts this guy to sleep, so he's just dreaming of zombies right now. So that's bad. So I need you to help me with this. And you guys got any idea how to destroy a gem? And this is interesting. I like this. The speedball ideas. Like, Rockhoof says, have you tried hitting it? And Sonambula says, yes. And I like your approach, dude. Uh, and Flash just says, when we fly, sometimes our gem cracks. And Stygian just says, oh, that's not height. It could be the change in temperature. And Major says, I have something for that. So, yay! Working together, solving the problem. Woo! Well, and now Sona and Bila does get to participate in the solution. But what I really love about this is she's the one who, even though she's saying, uh, no, that won't work, she's encouraging them to keep contributing ideas. This group has now swelled to more than triple its original size. Obviously, when you start with one, that's pretty easy. The more people you bring into a group the easier it is for miscommunication and butting heads. They need a moderator like Somnambula to keep people giving ideas while at the same end saying, okay, that's not going to work, but I like the, the track you're on. True, that, true, that. And it seems like a good plan. So they stick to a plan where Rockhoof is going to fling Somnambula to the pony with the gem, with his shovel. While doing that, she is holding a very volatile potion that could freeze her if things goes wrong. So Nambula, buddy, you have guts. Yep, so she's instantly part of the group and she's just all for it, popping pop culture references left and right. And of all the personality mismatches or, you know, the show versus the comics, this Somnambula is a Totally different character from the even-voiced, calm Somnambula we see in the show. Yep. I, I almost hear her in Pinkie Pie's voice. <laughs> yep. You know what? Not, I, not so much for me. I, I see her as her voice, but more peppy, more cheery, because uh, I, I, I don't know how to say this, but I think the writers here is putting a lot of pep to her because of hope. When you say hope, you have a lot of optimism. And looking at this, it feels... How do I put this? You can feel the optimism there. You agree? Well, mm, I find that hope is sometimes... It's what keeps you going when, when things look down. So she does bring a lot of energy. I don't know if that's necessarily... Not everyone who feels great hope is so perky. That is, I think, a trait inherent to Sonambula. True, but uh, it's one of those things where I notice it. Maybe audience here will type in what they notice about Sam. But hey, uh, at least the event is going. And so Nebula here kind of read the script because how do you know we're coming and how did you know that we're on an adventure? And so Nebula just says, well, a group of adventurers coming to town looking for me. It's obvious, right? You you have a problem and you need to and you need me to help you guys. So yay! Well, running theme in like her previous story in Legends of Magic, she has a way of looking at the world and just sort of seeing without letting distractions occupy her attention, even if that distraction is a giant snake eating your home. <laughs> yep. Oh goodness me! But anywho, uh, Rockhoof flings her off to the pony with the gem and. She executes the plan, and it works. And with that, the gem cracks and releases the pony from the curse. And said pony is the prince. Oh, goodness me. He does not have an easy life of it in these comics. Yep. And he is so confused. Uh, so then we'll uh, introduce the ponies to the prince, and the prince introduced 
you know what? They introduce each other, and uh, Sunembra is off on an adventure while the prince is confused at what just happened. Like, w- w- what happened? Of course, I love Sunambula's pop references. Are we taking back the streets? Protecting those who hate and fear us? Ooh, we are the ex ponies. Sneaked! <laughs> ah, much awesomeness, much awesomeness. So, anyway, they head off to their next adventure or they head off to their next recruitment person. Uh, this one's a bit of a stinker. Oh, really? No. I, I kind of like this one. Here's the thing after they faced rampaging herbivores that become just bulky bunnies and then dr- invasion of by dragons and then zombie uh, mummies. Now their greatest foe that they cannot conquer is a greenhouse. What kind of glass is she using in this greenhouse where even bucks from Rockhoof and crashes from Flash Magnus don't even cause a crack? Eh, I, I'm not sure, but still it's one of those cases. But in terms of the story arc, this is the relaxing point or the plateau where you just need to relax. And if you're reading it from back to back, this is kind of make the point of, okay, let's relax for a bit. Let's take it down a notch. But we didn't get that as we read this by monthly. So I can understand why you dislike this issue. Well, I mean, there's good slapstick as you see them fail, but then you just realize they're failing to a bunch of plants in a greenhouse. Uh, but let's... Unless someone within is singing, feed me Seymour, I'm going to have doubts. <laughs> but uh, as our hero are traveling to the next hero that they're trying to recruit, we go to Nip- uh, Napon. And it seems that Miss Main knows that she is being called. But the greenhouse don't agree and says, Nah, you're not, you, you, you're not going. We're not letting you go. So, no... And Miss Ming gets eaten by a plant. Oh no. So we move on to the next chapter where our heroes are already there. They knock on the door to the greenhouse and nobody's there. And it's strange because I- I'm going to pause here for a bit, guys, because I think this is time where we speed things up a bit because this issue may get a bit dull and boring at points. Agree, well, That's what I mean. There's- They're trying to break into a greenhouse, and this greenhouse is the Fortress of Solitude. (laughs) Yeah. So, like Silver mentioned, our heroes are trying to break into a greenhouse because, well, um, said greenhouse is locked and they can't get in. So, Stygian here assigns role to the ponies to find a way in because, well, the lock is from the inside and Miss May's in trouble and we need to help her. So... Rokov, you try to break down the door. And Flash, you try to find a way from the top. And Mitch and Sam, you try to find an entry point from anywhere else. Yes. So, like I mentioned before, Rokov tries to buck a door and fails. By the way, this is a glass house. Flash tries to bomb from above, but fails. And kind of falls flat on his face. And by looking at the situation... Mage sure kind of knows what's going on and devised a devious plan with Stygian where they did uh, where they do a lot of wordplays by trying to trick the plants into letting them in. And it seems that it works. And long story short, the plants are smart and they try to take the potion and well stop our heroes from getting in. And well, Stygian and Rockhoff here kind of save Mage from the, well, not really save, but and let Mage out of the man-eating plant, whatever it is. Oh, Norman, I, just, I find this fascinating. You're calling Mist Main Mage and Mage Mist Main. I have problems with names, especially if I'm trying to remember it from memory. Uh, but... Uh. <laughs> Memories. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, da, 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 da. I can't even remember the lyrics myself. <laughs> but anywho, um, they help Miss Main out of the plant. And Miss Main here just says, every plant and pony stop. And so they do. They listen to uh, Miss Main here and tells the plant that, don't worry. I know that 
I'll be away, but I'll be safe and I'll come back. So you don't worry, I'll be safe. And Stitchit says, um, how did you know that we're coming to recruit you? And Miss Ming here says, I, I can feel nature. I can feel the environment changing. I can feel it hold its breath and stuff. Like, let's just say that she has mambo jumbo magic stuff. Yay. And with that, they recruit Miss Main to the party. Yay. What was her role again in this one? Was her role, wait, Mage or Miss Main? We gotta be Miss Main. Clear because uh, Mage is the healer, Rockhoof is the, whatchamacallit, uh, assault or uh, DPS. Tank? Nah, the tank is more flash. Well, he's the warrior then. He's the warrior, he's the offensive. Uh, Miss Main, I guess, is your druid class. She is most aware of terrain, f- flora, and fauna. And basically good at, at seeing what other people tend to overlook. Sharing some traits with Somnambula. Actually, I'd argue that Miss Main, Somnambula, and Mage are all Support class? more the greater, well, observers. Ah. They're the best observers. All righty then. So, um, with that, Stygian says, okay, we need one last guy in the group. And we need to find Starshold the Bearded. And he's probably at the Castle of the Two Sisters. And Miss Main says, nah, he's not there. He's in another castle. <laughs> and said castle is the Cantalot Castle near the hill. And somehow, Sunambula says, you do not have any giant snakes here, do you? Continuity! Yes, it is continuity, Norman. Although, would you say you sound like you're in pain? Oh, the references at the continued storyline they hurt me so <laughs> I am in pain just happy. <laughs> I am in continuity pain uh, but anywho <laughs> I'm going to speed things up Stygian here is awestruck because he gets to see his idol and Miss Min just says um, you like him? Why don't you just go up to him talk to him? Well, I'll just wait back here and well relax with the crew and Stygian goes to meet Starswell and just introduce himself and try to talk to him but Starswell is in a bad mood because he has to take care of two pretty teenagers oh no that is a truly herculean effort i can understand why he develops a bit of a tude yep and <laughs> Starswell here is kind of mean to Stygian for a bit but Starswell here just says i'm sorry i didn't mean to <laughs> Try just imagine trying to take care of your future leader who are teenagers right now and stuff. Like, okay, well, what's your problem? What's your problem? And he explains that my town is in trouble and I need a mage. Would you help? Starshall here says, okay, um, what's the problem? And who's attacking your town? And Stygian says, sirens. Ooh, they're real. Ooh, I am excited. And Stygian here says, ooh, I read all of your books. Yay, all of them. And he starts to tell the story about the pillars and how wrong Starswell is. And with that, Stygian introduced the legendary heroes of Equestria. Yay! And Starswell here can't believe it because they're real. <laughs> he's, and he, he Starswell starts fanboying, which is uniquely appropriate. True, true. Oh my goodness. Well, there's a there's an important difference between the star swirl we see here and the star swirl in the show. Because after all the comics have tried to represent him like five, three to five different ways, we get this version. And I like this star swirl more than the one in the show because this one is just so caught up in the moment. He, he loses some manners. It's more a lack of awareness, whereas the Star Swirl in the show is more outright hostility or arrogance. But I do feel that it's time because in the show, he's represented as a pony who knows everything and done things to, well, save Equestria. And over there, he thinks of Twilight as a blunder because... You save us, that's awesome, but at the same time, you also release the thing that we try to save Equestria from. You are a not good pony, Princess Twilight. Granted that Starswell is a jerk, still. 
Well, he's, he's dismissive of just about everyone until he deems that you have value. Uh, he do, he doesn't treat you with any respect. This Star Swirl, he's not he. There is an element of that, but he's not so upfront hostile about it. It's more just being caught up in the moment. And also, we do see him having to endure Luna and Celestia being very clingy <laughs> as he departs. True that. True that. Like he is a father figure for those two. But as he gets to know the pillars, he unknowingly starts to muscle Stygian out. And you know what, Silver, let's try and streamline this because the whole conflict here right now is Stygian's confident in himself because once getting Starswell into the team, it seems that Stygian here lost all confidence in what he did throughout the whole adventure. And with that, like you mentioned before, Starswell is muscling onto the team. Like, he's trying to be the team leader and whatnot. And, yeah, with this, Stygian feels down because, well, first his idol dismisses him totally and him not knowing his name at all. If I'm not mistaken, Stygian did introduce himself, right? Yeah, he did, but Starswell probably forgot him. Yeah, so... That's not fun. That's not fun. Two stars struck. And even as they're on the journey and planning against the uh, sirens, the star swirl is trying to view everything from a very utilitarian standpoint. I mean, you brought us all together. Great. But now we're all together. So what do you do? And I, I appreciate that the pillars try to stand up for him, although Sonambula completely whiffs it. Friendship. Friendship is, well, it's not nothing. Friendship is important. The spirit of Twilight Sparkle in the future is going, It's magic! It's magic! Oh, we're jumping right to that one, eh? All right. Uh, so I'm just going to speed things up there. So, yeah. Um, Star Soul dismisses him. Star Soul's pack. The two princesses are clingy. And, and he teleports out of there. And they go off on a montage where Star Soul tries to gather info on the uh, legends or the heroes. And... While this is going on, uh, Mitch here walks up to Stygian and asks, what's wrong? You've been quiet for this whole trip. And Stygian just says, like, I'm a bit worried about what's going to happen. Like, I'm a bit, I'm, I'm worried about my town and whatnot. And he kind of comes up with a plan or explains a diagram about, okay, uh, the sirens here feed off the energy of the townsfolk. So I think it's best that we try and separate or remove their energy source from them so we can weaken them. And Starswell comes in and says that his plan is bad. Ah. Your plan is bad and you should feel bad while planning it. And in all honesty, I this is the point where I felt that Starswell is a big fat jerk. Like, I am angry. Like, this girl... Starswell comes up with, well, not really. He explains the pillars and whatnot and says that they're magical and special. And Flash here says, hey, wait, Stygian, didn't you have the same idea like that before? Ah, Starswell is a big fat jerk. Well, I mean, he's used to being right. He has linked his ego with his role as a wizard and advisor or sorcerer. So pride cometh before a fall. Yeah, and oh my goodness. when. Starswell here says, okay, um, Stygian, what do you do? Do you have anything special? And Stygian begrudgingly says, uh, I'm just a regular pony. I, I'm nothing special. And I feel bad saying that. Like, oh, I, I just feel bad. Well, it's kind of hard. You're surrounded by legends, living legends. It's very tempting to start measuring yourself by what they do against what you do. But if you only define yourself with I'm not, you'll end up with nothing. Uh, that's true. But if you have a person like Starswell putting you down or not supporting you, uh, that that feels bad. And you know what? I, I know I should save this till the discussion point of the episode, but I have to bring this here now because if I don't, I might forget. And here's the thing. Think about it like this. You have a esports group. Like, let's just say you play Overwatch competitively. You get a little talented people from around 
the world to be on your team. You get a really good DPS player, you get a good support player, you get a really good tank player. And you, who are you really? You are the guy who can stand toe-to-toe with them, but not good enough to compete, but you know what you're doing. So to me, I look at Stygian here as the coach of the crew. He is the support that gathers everything. Like he is the tactician. He is the leader, as they say. Like he's Zordon. Hmm. Alpha five, teleport to me five overbearing, over emotional ponies with attitude. <laughs> Yay. So to me, Stygian here is Zordon because he is the guy who gathered the heroes to do the heroic thing. The way this presents it, Star Swirl is so focused on finding a solution that he forgets the ponies around him. And he starts judging everyone by their renown rather than treating them as they are in the moment. Which is an easy thing to do when you yourself are, when you occupy a place of prominence. He is the advisor to the future rulers of the land and their teacher. So he's got, he probably, he's buying into his own hype. And that's very easy to do. So in some ways, I find this star swirl a bit more sympathetic than the one we see in the show. But yes, he is he is treating Stygian very poorly. And because he's being so clumsy in the solution uh, of this prop crisis, he's laying the foundation for the next. Yep. Which is sadly true to history. Yeah. And he, here's also a thing where um, Stygian's plan here is to try and talk the sirens down but star soul here says once you're bad you can never go back and star soul here is the problem he he is the problem <laughs> i think we'll talk about more on the on the annual but let's hit into the plan in action so everybody knows their role and made sure created a potion to make them deaf for a bit so that they won't be hypnotized by the siren song and made sure only made enough for six and Stygian has to stay behind and, well, just look. And if all else fails, it's the messenger boy to get Celestia and Luna. And this here, the next page here, it's, it's awesome where the Pillars of Equestria leap into action. But while all this is happening... Okay, I'm just going to skip the whole fight scene. You guys can go check it out because it's really awesome. So, while this is happening... Stygian just sits back and says to himself, I should be down there. And that is sad. That, that is, oh my goodness. Like, he he should be there. He should be in the heat of the action, helping the ponies and stuff. Like, he should be there. And that's him being hard on himself. He He specifically got all these characters or these legends, because he needed their strength. He knew this was something beyond his ability. In that way, that shows a lot of maturity, that he uh, he's willing to acknowledge his limits and not surrender to them, but find a way to work around them. I can't do it, but I know where to find ponies who could, if they exist. Mm-hmm. Problem is that now he's holding himself against their standard rather than celebrating what he did. And he is a hero. Yeah. He journeyed across the entire equestrian landscape faced any number of challenges and survived them, solved them, and made this moment possible. This is his triumph, even if he's not the the head lead fighter. And it's just, it's an unfortunate tale of, well, investing your energy in the wrong places, putting your focus on what you think of as a deficiency rather than your strength. True that. And, oh my, like, this is a tragic tale because Stygian... In the comics, by the way, is an awesome guy. Like, ah, oh man. Like, if I were to say who's my favorite pillar, I would just say Stygian because he he is the unsung hero. That's the thing. And with that, he with his confidence uh, shook, he tries to find a way to find his way to be a hero, and he discovers that by copying the attributes or copying the what you would call this uh, uh, there's a line here uh, enough. Uh, if he were to borrow the symbols of each of 
uh, each of their strengths, uh, he could become something amazing. But we all know what happened, right? Uh, and we'll get more of a reminder of that in the annual. Mm -hmm. And with that, we go back to the present day where Sunburst says, I'm no hero. And with that, he wants to talk to Stygian. And over here, uh, Sunburst talks to Stygian and they talk. And, well, they both are scholars. They both understand one another. And Sunburst here just says that he read through the book front and back and thinks that Stygian was a hero and he missed his opportunity and stuff. And he just mentions that if things had gone differently, he could have been Princess Twilight, the element of magic, the prince of friendship, if you might say. Which means we should totally ship these two, yes. I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, with that, Sunburst says, Stygian, you are a hero. And this makes Stygian really, really happy. And with that, they walk to the sunset. But before that, um, Sunburst has a theory. And Sid theory is about how Star Soul the Beard is the greatest villain of all Equestria. Ouch. <laughs> I know. And Stygian says, hmm, you make an interesting case. I totally agree with you. Well, I mean, here's the thing. I don't villainy in my eyes is someone who actually enjoys uh, hurting others. They they they're taking pride in what they've done. Star Swirl, I don't think he ever enjoyed hurting others. It's just something he did through very very tun tunnel vision. But he is the cause of a great deal of misfortune. Maybe if he'd handled this better, uh, the pillars wouldn't have disappeared. He could have been a better coach to Luna, who wouldn't have fallen to Nightmare Moon. And it seems like a lot of things just sort of flow from that one mistake. I kind of wonder if we'd ever get to revisit uh, Celestia and Luna handling Sombra and the Crystal Empire if they berated themselves for making a mistake and losing the Empire. Would they have done better if Star Swirl had been there? Probably we'll get that answer in the future. Like you mentioned before, uh, King Sombrero might be coming back. So, yay. Aha! King Sombrero! And with that, comic ends. So let's go on to, well, discussion and final thoughts. If there's any discussion to be had, Silver? Woo -wee. Well, we've covered a lot. I mean, this is one big grand adventure, each one leading into a character joining the group. But first they have to take care of what's immediately before them. And maybe that is the group's greatest undermining quality. They're all so preoccupied with the immediate, they have a hard time looking at the bigger picture which is how they lose Stygian. They all stand by him, but they don't see how it's affecting them because in the aftermath of the uh, defeating the Sirens, they're celebrated as heroes and they ignore their for their friend. So really, the while it's Star Swirl's weakness in that he's the most exemplary uh, fault, all of them struggle with the same issue. They say, oh, I can't leave. I've got to take care of this problem. Oh, I can't leave. I've got to look out for this place. And Stygian has to solve their problem for them to help him. So that's an interesting theme. Yeah, that's true. And like any other story, if you take a look, see the adventurer travels to find a party. And uh, in a normal story, he would be considered the hero. But in this story here, nah, he ain't no hero, yo. He got no powers. He's just a normal dude. Oh no, what can a normal dude do against... People who has magical mutant powers. Do the do. Dude. But still, I, I feel like Stygian here got the short end of the stick in terms of the way that the story was treating him to the end. At the very beginning, you, you rooted for him. You, you wanted him to succeed. And when issue 12 came along, I felt pissed off. I can tell. I know. It's like... Oh, I am so mad. Like, ah. But it all lays the stage for the future tragedy and Twilight basically cleaning up everyone else's mess. True. that. And I have to say that the writer here, uh, who is named Jeremy Whitley, if, e? if he could get that emotion out of me from this comic, 
I have to say that he did a really good job. Indeedy. And I, I like to use this line, or I, I like to use this phrase, where if an actor plays a villainous part and you hate him, that means the actor is doing a good job. That means the actor is doing something right because you hate him or you hate the character. So the actor is doing something good. Yep. Or the writer. Because I, uh, Littlefinger from Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. he's a villain you love to hate. <laughs> but still, it's one of those cases where it's the writer and the actor. And in this scenario, it's the writer and the artist. Both of them did a really good job. And yeah, this this is a really good read. And I think this is the first time where it takes, what, uh, six issues to tell a story. Because beforehand, the longest that we got was four issues. Well, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I like it when the comics uh, do sort of self-contained stories that build up. Kind of like Sombra's micro set the table for Siege of the Crystal Empire. True that, true that. Which... Well, I have criticisms of Siege. I like how they built that up. Yep, true that. And one disappointment for me in the comics was the 51st issue. Uh, oh, the start where we meet Shadowlock? Yeah. <laughs> that book there, that 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 whole issue. I, in all honesty, I feel like that issue is null and void. Because we never get to see Shadowlock again. And he yep. Has yet to meet his his descendant, yep. or his ancestor. Like, how 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 do I put this? Like, you develop an edge lot character who is awesome and all, and who has a really awesome backstory to him, and he's trying to well, um, what what I'm looking for? Uh, he's trying to stop the end of the world happening by erasing books, but in the end, it doesn't even matter. Like, whatever you're doing. It doesn't matter. Stop it. Like, go home. <laughs> oh, boys. Well, that's the that's the fate of second tier canon. Yeah, but... It's just lost in the wind. Yeah, but... <laughs> so long, farewell. Oh, yeah. Talking about second tier, uh, second tier canon, the sirens in the Finship is magic story. That's, the, that's thrown out the window. <laughs> well, in my eyes, that's not a loss. <laughs> I know. Oh, yes, but anywho, oh, wow, oh, I, I think what this this comic uh, review is coming out around Christmas, so, yay, happy Christmas, y'all. We gave you the gift of a six-in-one review. I know. And now, and now we are the tired. Yes, yes, but so, um, the annual, we'll be doing it next year, so, yays. So, Silver, let's wrap this up. What are we going to do next week? Well, we're not quite done with Star Swirl the Bearded, because of all things, we're going to be talking about a friendship university, or as I like to call it, FU. <laughs> ah, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> See, I can do this out the entire FU, and Sweetie Bot can't censor me, because it's really just do letters. <laughs> it's not my fault. Yep, yep. Oh, my goodness. Oh, and we get to see the Flim Flam back again. In all honesty, Flim Flam are my guilty pleasures. <laughs> I love them. Uh, These boys got issues. Yeah. And previously, when we were pre-recording, we were talking about um, which villain do you like, like, think are very awesome. And I mentioned before uh, Prince uh, Lothor from uh, Voltron, Legendary Defenders. I'm going to take it back. No, the Flim Flam Brothers, they're my favorite. <laughs> Ah, uh, he's Flim, he's the Flim, the world-famous Flim Flam Brothers. They make good songs, even though they're bad. <laughs> uh, but anywho, yes, that will be next week's review. Probably we'll do a special in between if the Christmas tree part comes out. They're really short and stuff, so yeah. But anywho, if you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at com. You can also reach us on the Twitters. The show's Twitter account is at NBS Show. And you can reach me at Norman Sanzo. And Silver, where can the good people find you? Well, you can find me under the Twitters under uh, MLP Silver Quill. Also on DeviantArt under MLP Silver Quill. I post every Wednesday on Equestria Daily with a comic review or editorial. 
And I'm most mostly known for my YouTube channel. Just do a search for Silver Quill or After the Fact, and ye shall find me. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Go check out his videos, guys, because Silver here does an awesome and amazing job. He puts a lot of time and effort to it. And I think you guys should just check it out because he's really awesome. He's really fun. Well, danke schön. You're making me blush. Oh, uh, well, you deserve it, man. And also, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes, YouTube. Don't forget to press the bell icon to stay up to date and Stitch Radio. And also like our Facebook page. You can also catch us on PonyVLive.com. Also, do subscribe to the Review and Discussion Podcast on iTunes and Stitch Radio. You'll be listening to us here on this platform. It's a lot of fun. And we're going mobile. Woohoo! And if you would like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash dmbs show. With every support, you get a week's early access to review and discussion podcast exclusive and deleted content. And a huge thank you from me. Thank you about thank yous. I like to thank myself, Lag, Amy, Lucky Knight, Tristan, Starstream, Lurker Cat, and also Jeffrey. Thank you so much, guys. You're great. So I have been Norman Sanzo. I am Cecil Vakil. And we will guys catch you next week with another amazing episode of the BS Show. See ya. Adios. Happy holidays, guys. I hope that you guys have a really great time with your friends and family. With many good presents and cheer and just take it easy. Goodness knows we could all use that. Yep, yep. And we'll catch you guys next year. Until then. Until then.